Hello, everyone. Welcome to a basic. And I am excited to share some documents with you. So we're going to start to take a look at what the Freedman records really, really entail. Let us take a look now and we're going to get started. One of the things that people don't understand when looking or even talking about Freedman records are the fact that there are some records that were created between 1898 and 1914. Let's take a look and see exactly what those are. Well, you hear a lot about the Dawes records or the Dawes roll. This roll is actually the base roll. The base roll used for membership in five federally recognized tribes, Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole nations. However, these roles, because there were roles that were created from each of the tribes, they have left a plethora of information that you can use to get started with your research. So what are they exactly? They are a collection of records, as I already said, between 1898 and 1914. They began prior to Oklahoma statehood, and they ended seven years after Oklahoma statehood. It's the single largest collection of records that will reflect Native and African American interconnected families. No other set of records is this extensive. And these records reflect the five tribes that I've already mentioned from Indian Territory. Now, some facts about these records and what they actually are. First of all, they were created for a single purpose, and you cannot get away without talking about land. These records were created to determine eligibility for land allotments. Those who were enrolled had to have ties to Indian Territory and to one of the five tribes. They were not created for tribal membership. Because remember this one fact, it is all about the land. You hopefully will eventually get to records such as the one that you see that reflected the fact that the enrollees actually received allotments of land. Now, the purpose was actually to redistribute land that already belonged to people who owned it. The concept was to introduce personal land ownership to the tribes that had before this time owned land in common. Now, basically they were giving the land back to the people who already owned the land, but by introducing a concept of private land ownership, that meant millions of other acres would be then available for people to come in and eventual statehood, which did occur. The concept was basically to open it up for millions, well, millions of acres for thousands of white settlers to come into the territory and create this new state. And the two territories, Indian Territory and Oklahoma Territory became a state in 1907. This process of allotting land and determining who was eligible, who was not eligible, and creating these roles of eligibility took more than 10 years. Interviews were conduct conducted throughout the territory, giving people a place on the ensuing role. And of course, this process of enrolling, meaning not joining or making people a member of something, but placing their names upon this list, upon this roll of Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole nations. And this was the process that they went through. 
As I said again, it did not mean membership. It meant simply making them eligible. And of course, there are many pages to that volume, more than 600 pages that became the final role in all types of categories. They were classified in every single tribe, every single one of those five tribes that I just mentioned as either citizens by blood, citizens who were freedmen, those who were intermarried whites, those who were minors, and those who were newborns. Thus, if you take the Cherokee Nation, for example, you had Cherokee by blood, Cherokee freedmen, Cherokee intermarried whites, Cherokee minors and newborns, Cherokee freedmen minors, Cherokee freedmen newborns. And there were similar categories for the other tribes, Choctaw by blood, Choctaw freedmen, Choctaw intermarried whites, and so on. You will often find people referring to an enrollment card. This is a typical card that one will see that reflects the various families. You will see, for example, in this case, on the left, you see where people lived, what their residence was, where their post office was. Over to the right, you see a card number or a field card number. To the left, you see the names of people who are being enrolled. And then to the left of their name, you see numbers. Those numbers became their role number. By blood cards, as these are often called, were one-sided cards, but they contained a lot of information about the enrollee. And in the middle of the card, you'll see information about their parents, their father, their mother. Friedman cards were a little bit different. They were two-sided cards. You see on the front side, we're looking at the card of Hannah Van in this case. You see, she lived in the Kuskokwim district in the Cherokee Nation, living in Lenape, or close to Lenape, which was where her post office was. You see, Hannah and her daughter Annie, and you see that she had been enslaved. Her slave holder was Stan Wadey. Yes, the Stan Wadey. On the back side of the card, you see the name of Hannah's father, George Johnson, in the Saline district. He was enslaved by Joseph Lynch. And you see the name of her mother, Nancy Wadey, enslaved by Stan Wadey. And of course, we've already seen her daughter, Annie, on the front. Her daughter, Annie's father, was a man called William Van. And of course, the mother of Annie was the person who was number one on the car, who was Hannah herself. Intermarried whites had similar cards. Their cards were basically the same as those who were considered citizens by blood with the names of their parents as well. And you see stamped on the top, citizens by intermarriage. Unfortunately, one could not become a citizen by intermarriage as a freedman. They did not accept intermarried freedmen, meaning people who had married states or state Negroes, as they were called, someone who had migrated from Arkansas or Mississippi or Louisiana into the territory and married a freed person, they did not consider them citizens by intermarriage. Citizens by blood are minors, newborns. As you see in this case, this is a Cherokee minor card. And you see the name of the child, but you see the name of the father and the mother. In the case of freedmen, there were the freedmen minors or the freedmen newborns. And of course, the name of the child and the name of the father and mother of that child. There are many components of the records, and it's very important that people look at all of the records. You know, you don't just want to find yourself simply in a situation where, oh, I've gotten my name, here's my ancestor's name, here's their name, here's their role number, and that's it. And of course, some people will just go after a name and, oh, I can enroll in the Cherokee Nation. Here's the name, here's the role number, and that's it. And they'll never look at the rest of their family's story. But these are the components, because you want to look and find their story. The enrollment cards, 
the application jackets. That's where you find the actual interview. You find the actual words of your ancestor. You, in a sense, you find their voice. You find the actual land allotment records, which gives you the actual legal land description where you can go today and pull up a record and find exactly where they lived and what's there now. And of course, see their names upon the final row as well. And of course, in the case of Friedman, you'll see basically their name and simply their roll number. In the case of the Walton family, for example, you see Sam in the enclosed box, Sam, Sally Houston, and Sam Jr. And of course, if you compare that with their enrollment card, right on the line where their name is to the left, you'll find that that was their roll number stamped upon that card. As we looked at the card earlier of Hannah Van and her daughter Annie, card number 1342, we see some other pieces of information, especially when we go to those other categories. We'll find in her application jacket, we find her husband, William Van, was testifying on her behalf, on the behalf of not only her, but also of himself, because he too was a free person, and he too selected land on behalf of the family you find rich documents that contain part of the family's story. You also find all kinds of records in those land allotment jackets. You can find plat maps of the family, where the land was, in terms of what township, what range, what section. All of that information is there. And the data is really, really rich. Now, it's important to point out and to understand you're going to find things that may leave you upset um, because it was not a process that treated everyone equally. The process was not fair across all five of the tribes. Now, Cherokees, Creeks, and Seminoles basically all received equal parcels of land. Choctaw and Chickasaw Freedmen received 40 acres each. And you might say that's not bad if it's a family of, of six or eight children, that's a good chunk of land. However, if you are on the roll by blood as Choctaw and Chickasaw, every person, including those babies, would have been allotted 320 acres of land. So Friedman started out with one eighth of the amount of land that was allotted to others in their same nation, born on the same soil or stated a different way, Choctaws and Chickasaws by blood were given eight times the opportunity to create, establish, and maintain generational prosperity. The odds were stacked against many of the freedmen, which did happen. And also the categories themselves, those who were classified as citizens by blood, that category did not incorporate everyone who had quote unquote Indian blood. There were many freedmen who had a parent who was of native ancestry, yet they were placed on the freedmen roll. Not all freedmen were freed people. Many of them had been born free, had never been enslaved, yet they were also classified as freedmen because they had African ancestry. The founder of the Caesar Bruner Band, which is a band that still exists today in the Seminole Nation. You see Caesar Bruner himself put on the Freedman Roll. But this man, as you look over to the right, following the line that bears his name, and where it says slave of, there is no slaveholder, because there was no one who enslaved him. He was a person born free, yet he's put on the category as a freedman or a freed person. And today, members of this band that bears his name, as well as his colleague, Dosa Barthes, they're all freedmen receiving no benefits in the nation today.
The most important thing in this process, though, is to study these records and tell the story. Tell the story accurately of this free man, of this man who became a leader in the nation where he was born. So how many freedmen were there? Now, all together, with the whole Dawes process, there were over 90,000 people, 91,000 people from all five categories were enrolled. Among the freedmen, almost 4,000 Cherokee freedmen, 3,982. Choctaws, 5,254. Chickasaw, 4,995. Creeks, 5,585. Seminole freedmen, 857, plus 93 children added later. The total number of freedmen from Indian Territory by the time the process ended was 20,766 people. Freedmen from Indian Territory are among the most documented people, especially considering the fact that these are documenting families of African descent with a provable tie to Native communities, not talk, not anecdotal information, not information where someone might say, well, I hear that. No, I can prove that. No other record set has a population to exceed the African Native people of Indian Territory. Here are a few facts for you. Whether they were classified as people by blood or not, the Indian freedmen lived within a native community. They were immersed into a native culture. These people practiced the lifestyle of the culture into which they were born. Whether they were freedmen or mixed families by blood, these individuals spoke the language. They practiced the customs of the native community in which they were all born. Their presence in what became Oklahoma preceded Oklahoma statehood. Their presence preceded the establishment of the 30 or more all black towns. Their presence preceded those of the Oklahoma land rush in 1889 and those who jumped the gun, the Sooners. Freedmen presence preceded that. Their presence preceded the end of the Civil War and the conflict of the war itself. There's so many stories from this population to find, to go and capture. And I urge you to go and start to study and to read the Oklahoma slave narratives, the Indian pioneer papers. Read those files from the Joe and Dillard Perry files. Start with the Joe and Dillard Perry. These two brothers themselves, the Perry boys, incredible story. Read the Civil War pension files of the U.S. colored troops and of the first, second, and third Indian Home Guards. Read those affidavits from the Wallace Walls. Don't forget the congressional record and, of course, Record Group 105, known by many of us as the Freedmen's Bureau the official name being the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. There's so many stories of freedmen leaders, whether it's those who came from Florida, Negro Abraham, who came with them, Betty Ligon, head litigant in Equity Case 7071, and so many more. Caesar Bruner, the man himself. But there were also countless others. You've got Charles Cohey. You've got Caesar Bruner's brother, Pero Bruner, who was Greek, full brothers, one Seminole, one Greek. You have Hagar, Hagar Myers, a woman who herself made a contribution to bring about the end of the Green Peach War. Incredible stories for us to tell, incredible stories for us to find. And we haven't scratched the surface yet. You are urged to start to research these records, research them in depth, 
Let's not rely on just something that you've heard. Let's go and rely on things that you have found because it has been documented. The full story of Oklahoma Freedmen has yet to be told. Explore those Dawes records, study the people, tell their story. I urge you to join the Oklahoma Freedmen Collective, a group of individuals who are looking for these very stories. And join a community of people who are hoping to put this history back. The story of the Freedmen of Indian Territory must be put back on the historical landscape from which it came. For contact information or more information about the Freedmen Collective, send an email to hello at Oklahoma Freedmen, okfreedmen.org. Okay anyway, thank you all for listening and paying attention. And I certainly hope that there's going to be so much more that we can share with each other. Thank you very much for listening.